as is apparent from looking at the panel, you can tell we have uh, some distinguished faculty here with us today. But the purpose of the book of this semester is to encourage uh, the rest of us, all of us across campus, to be engaged in, in reading a book each semester, perhaps outside of our formal discipline, uh, but something that deals with an important international topic. Uh, in the past, we've had such speakers as Jared Diamond, Jean Bethke Elstein, uh, Laurie Garrett, uh, Ross Terrell, T.R. Reed. And so we're very pleased this semester to focus on the next Christendom, uh, The Coming of Global Christianity by Philip Jenkins. This is one of uh, over 20 books that Professor Jenkins has written. Uh, this is a book that has received a, a good deal of, of notoriety. I uh, just was listening on public radio yesterday and heard a, a discussion with him. Uh, it's, it's a current topic, but it's also an argument that uh, has been going on for some time. And it raises some interesting uh, contentions. Professor Ted Lyon, who will be chairing this panel, is the coordinator for Latin American Studies, uh, an academic uh, program hosted at the Kennedy Center. He's also a professor of Spanish. He's also the uh, faculty member who recommended this book. Uh, I guess we'll find out if that is for, for good or for ill, or how that plays out here in just a few moments. But uh, he, he brought this book to our attention as a book that um, was worthy of consideration. Other panelists include my far left, Professor Richard Halsaffel, uh, Associate Professor of Church History and Doctrine. Uh, on my direct left here, Professor Roger Keller, Professor of Church History and Doctrine. Professor Ted Lyon here on my right. To the right of him, Professor Paul Hoskison, uh, the Richard L. Evans Chair of Religious Understanding and a Professor of Ancient Scripture. And then to his right, on, on the far right, I guess, huh? uh, we, we, we get into this every time we do a panel, right? Uh, Mark Grover, it's just, it's just location, right? African and Latin American Subject Specialist at the Harold B. Lee Library. Uh, please join me in welcoming our panelists, and I'll turn the time over to Professor Ted Lyon. I guess by that then I'm the centrist that tries to, to, to bring the, the, the possible uh, political sides together. Uh, I don't want to take uh, full credit certainly for recommending this book, but I do want to, to because I uh, tell you the story, I, well, I thought it was about time that we read something related to, to Latin America and the third world in general, and so I pulled my faculty and, and Mark Grover, who's on the far right, uh, <clears throat> was the one who really recommended this, and I want him to, to get more credit than, than, than any of the rest of us. And since that time, we've uh, all read through the book or read the book again, and we're getting into it. I'm pleased today to be here with this panel for some very unique reasons. We looked at other professors from other areas besides religion, and we didn't find enough professors from other areas that would be up on this. I wanted a, a professor of sociology of religion. I wanted a professor of anthropology and religion. Uh, I wanted professors of, of law and religion. And I couldn't find them, although there are some from law, but they were not dealing with this, this area of the third world. But I'm delighted uh, to say that in our own Department of Religious Studies, we find some excellent scholars who are up to date on these things. So I'm praising you if you can't tell this, uh, brethren. Gentlemen, you, you, you deserve to be praised for, for some wonderful background and wonderful experience. And so we're, we're thankful for that. I'm very pleased with this book and, and the, th the point that, that it makes because it's trying to look at the world on a global perspective rather than simply a, a, a single continent or a single country's perspective. We've had Jared Diamond here. Some of you may have read Jared Diamond's works really, again, on this global perspective, looking at world history. Or, or McNeil, a historian from the University of Chicago. I'm sure he's retired now, but at any rate, this type of global perspective is what, what interests me. And fortunately, this book allows us to look not only at uh, Latin America, which is our area or my area, but also Africa and uh, Southeast Asia and other parts of the world as they relate to the concept of religion. I want to uh, start off by giving the time to um, Mark Grover just to give us uh, three or four minutes of, of introduction to the thesis of this book and the direction it's going, and then we're going to jump into some discussion as I pose some questions to the panel. Happy to be here. I just want you to know that Ted is is ready, is giving me the credit for this because if it doesn't work, I get the blame. So I just remember as I was a missionary many, many years ago, a joke was told about a uh, 
a poor man in the interior of Brazil whose one of his teenage daughters couldn't take the poverty anymore and ran away to the big city and came back in a couple of, after a couple of years dressed in a beautiful dress with lots of jewelry and throwing around a lot of money. And her father asked her, he says, you know, you left here as, as uh, you know, unable to read, and now you come back with all this money. How is that possible? And she said, Papai, eu sou uma prostituta. I'm a prostitute. He gets angry, throws her out, the, out of the house, and says, no daughter of mine will ever be a Protestant. She says, no, I'm a prostitute, not a Protestant. He welcomes her back, asks for her forgiveness, and says, it's all right to be a, pr a prostitute, but not a Protestant. You know, if Dr. Jenkins' uh, ideas are right, um, that family is now half, at least half, probably half Protestant. So anyway, this book uh, places the expansion of, ev of the evangelical Protestant Christianity in a world context and attempts really, I think, to inform Western Christianity scholars uh, of, of where uh, Christianity is actually growing. I, I find, and, I, and the, my approach to this, and I find the key argument of this book, is a failure of the academic community and the media to recognize the growth of the evangelical Protestant churches throughout the world. He states, he says, so little did we notice this momentous change. What I'd like to suggest is that those uh, who study religion, primarily those in, I mean, that I know in Latin America, we did notice what was happening, but we chose not to acknowledge that it was happening. A, um, I, I feel that a, that a strong ideological agenda by many academics uh, refused to study what they knew was going on. I think in Latin America that, uh, that, that occurred in the 1960s with the development of de a dependency theory and a parallel development of liberation theology, which saw the study of religion in terms of social aspects, uh, saw the, uh, the use of the Catholic Church primarily, but also Protestant churches as a, as a social mechanism to change um, uh, political governments and, econ and econ economic systems that were felt to be uh, negative and, um, and uh, to the poor. And so um, by accepting that, that ideology then and becoming so enamored with it, I think, that they tried to will with the force of their attention and their writing um, a, an, a, a theology and a movement that was best suited to their view of the world. And so they, by, they ignored the, the, the religious aspects, the faith, faith aspects of the religious experience and focused on the secular, the political, and the social aspects uh, and outcome of the religious experience. They basically failed to even recognize what was happening. They knew what was happening, but they just didn't understand what was going on. And I think Latin America then is, is a primary example because Protestantism and the evangelical and Pentecostal movement has been very much a part of the history for the last 50 years of the religious, act, religious movement in Latin America. Those who were studying knew something was happening. You could hear it on the street. Those of you who have been in Latin America, you know that the Protestants have um, a lot of activity going on. Uh, that's that's heard into the street, but 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 how do you deal then with an evangelical movement? Well, this is the way they dealt with it, I I think, and uh, you know they saw it as an arm of the United States, financed by U.S. money, uh, and primarily um, many of them believed uh, CIA money, that and all of this was uh, done to develop support for military governments at the time. That they were taking advantage of economic and social disruptions that were occurring in Latin America. Um, and uh, consequently, uh, their answer to that ad is to basically ignore them. So you you place that pro you know that pro U.S. label on them, and then you put them in the corner, and you don't uh, you, you you don't study them because uh, they're part of the, they're they're part of the problem that's occurring, and you focus on the nice things that are happening within the liberation theology and the activities of the of the primarily the Catholic Church. The problem is is that by doing that the evangelicals then began to expand and grow and they could not ignore them anymore and um, and consequently there's this kind of fascinating transitional period of literature between almost a hundred percent focus on the Catholic Church to right now where there's almost a hundred percent focus on the Protestants or the, or the evangelicals and and this transitional period is interesting because these these liberation theologians then had to start studying the evangelicals. But I just want to read one example it's in the introduction by David Lehman, a British scholar, in which he studies uh, the uh, common, he combines the study of uh, the Catholic Church with, a, with evangelical. This is what he said. I want you to notice 
you know, he's admitting things here that he probably shouldn't have admitted. He said researching Pentecostalism in Brazil and probably other, other places is at first a unique and frequently shocking experience. The, the, the wailing, shouting, and above all, electronic amplification which accompany religious celebration often assails the ears with almost unbearable force, and the response to the researcher's request for information or opinion can be a ferocious assault on his soul. Then he goes down and he states this, with this experience behind him, the social science scientist in reporting and analyzing the field data will have extreme difficulty in suppressing an attitude of contempt, disdain, amusement, even shock, or admiration and wonderment. If a person describes a miraculous cure, or even a cure which has no medical ex explanation, how can I describe the account without inviting the reader to share those attitudes of mine in some sort of complicity? How can I reproduce a testimony of conversion complete with fits, healings, and claims of moral regeneration without either betraying patronizing disbelief or conversely implying inviting the reader to believe all of those claims? In other words, and I have talked to, the, I've talked to many of these researchers, there was an absolute contempt for what was happening. And by the way, they may have pulled the evangelicals out of that corner, but the Mormons and the Jehovah Witnesses are still there. So with many, many scholars refusing to study us because of that, of that, that uh, connection they feel with the United States. What I, what I think and what, what uh, Dr. Jenkins talks about is, the, is that during this early period with such a focus on the social aspects of religion, they failed to look at the spiritual aspects of the religion and why people were making the changes. I mean, they, they would suggest things like, uh, uh, you know, a movement from the rural to the urban areas. Uh, death in the family, all of those things, you know, economic problems, loss of jobs, and that's the reason then they change. And the, the problem with that and what's happened with the, and what's happening now with the more recent research that's going on is that that doesn't mean that you change religions. And that doesn't give a reason for why you accept Mormonism and you don't accept the, uh, you know, charismatic Catholics, for example. There's something else. And my, what I have su would like to suggest is that researchers need to listen to their, to their informants. You know, I've done probably 400 interviews of members, uh, members of the LDS Church, and I've asked them, why did you join? Why, what was the conversion experience? It was, I, can, I can almost say that none of them said it was because my child died. They may have, they may have began looking because of that, but they always, always, always talk about some sort of a spiritual experience that occurred. And I think that's what researchers need to do, and I think that's what Professor Jenkins is suggesting. We need to understand why is it that people are changing religion, and, and you have to look at that, at that aspect. So Latin America, Africa, and Asia now are going through momentous religious change. Some call it the New Reformation. People are searching, they're looking, they're leaving the Catholic Church, they're entering evangelical churches, they're coming back, they're going forth. It's rather confusing and exciting if you're studying it. So, but, but in Jenkins' thesis, it's true that Christianity is not dying, it's just that it's, it's got a different accent right now. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, to continue, now we'll be talking among ourselves for the next two and a half hours, and then, no, not quite, but for the next few minutes, and then give a chance to you toward the end of the hour to, to ask questions and, and respond. Um, we encourage you to buy this book if you haven't, uh, get it. It's, it's, it is, there are selling them in the bookstore, aren't they? Uh, right? Isn't there a special display when you, when you come in anyway? Uh, Professor Philip Jenkins is a, a British scholar but teaching at Penn State University and very, very prolific in, in what, he's, what he's done. To add to what Mark has said, he takes, from a demographic standpoint, the years 2025 and 2050 and then tries to project the growth of Christianity in various areas of the world. And the thesis says simply that as Christianity is weakening, and he uses some other terms, even degenerating and so on, in the northern hemisphere, the southern hemisphere, and what he refers to as the south, and certainly not the south of the United States, but the s south, meaning anything from Mexico on south, and all of Africa, the Philippines and Southeast Asia, and even, curiously enough, gets into a little bit into India and China, <clears throat> are all experiencing dramatic growths of Christianity, uh, be they evangelical or, or um, Catholic or charismatic Catholic or, or various movements, and that is the thesis. And the idea is that these will establish the next Christendom, the next Christendom. 
I, I'd like to ask our, our professors here of of Christendom or of Christianity, of, of scholars, uh, your response. Is indeed there a new Christendom coming? Do you see that? I'd like you to respond. You're welcome to either come to the microphone or stay there, but make sure you use a microphone if you're sitting down. Well, okay. Uh, okay, let's go. Who, um, you know, the, the book is interesting. You, the first thing you do is you look in the index and see what it says about Mormons, because often, <laughs> like Time Magazine or Newsweek or, or Atlantic Monthly, whatever, when you read something about Mormons and you see where they got us wrong, it kind of helps you judge on how they get everybody else wrong. So, so the first thing you do is you look and see what he says. Ironically, there's really only three places where he talks about us, and two of the places simply to say, even if you take the Mormons out as being non-Christian, the statistics are still viable. I mean, that's his point of the article. But he does say something up front, page 86. He talks about how things are changing. And he uses the uh, Latter-day Saints. He doesn't quite get it right with the spelling or how we do our name, but th that's fine. We'll, we'll correct it when he comes and visits us. Yeah. But the point is, he talks about how our literature and how everything else is um, centered using this backdrop of Latin America. Our film showing Christ in some type of Mesoamerican type of context and shows that, you know, that basically we got it right and therefore we're having success. Uh, so the question is, is there really a new Christendom coming? Uh, in the first century, it's obvious that uh, the client kings of Rome, Herod and then his sons, tried to produce a Roman veneer upon the Galilee. I mean, you can see it in the architecture in Tiberias and other places where you have the, the Roman streets, you have the marketplace, and you have the red tile roofs. And this veneer seems like that they're, they're making something new, but it erupts in AD 66. There's a revolution that eventually consumes the whole area. So the question is, is there a, a veneer that something else is going to erupt, or is it really something that systematically is changed? And uh, I just follow the footsteps of, of both of you who is down in South America doing some speaking, and it, it seems to me that uh, he might have something here, that there really is something substantially different. He, of course, has some concerns. He sees that uh, in the earliest phases of Christianity, there, there was this problem of when you moved into certain new missionary areas, there was a kind of synergistic or synchronistic uh, adaptation of, of ideas. But there was always a central authority that could make sure that Christianity remained viable to its central core beliefs. His big concern here is with these Protestant groups, these evangelical groups, there is no institutional leaders. So he sees this as a potential difference that will occur. So I, I think he's right. I think there's something going on. How far it will be. You know, he's the first one to predict and say there are unforeseen events on the horizon that might change my statistics. But I think he's pretty confident and I think I think he's got something here. Thank you. Thank you very much. But but if there's no central core, no unity, there can't be what we at least uh, we can't compare it to a, another Christendom of uh, of the 1200s or 1300s because there was a unity of, of Christianity, right? Well, I, I guess if we look at it, you know, one of the things that uh, the recent Judas Gospel, Da Vinci Code, all these things, and Elaine Pagel have been trying to say is that maybe we've been we, we've tried to see uh, early Christianity as a, a monolithic block, and actually uh, the Nag Hammadi texts and the other things demonstrate that it's actually much more lively. And so I think maybe that's the case here. Okay. Yeah, that was the point that I wanted to make, is that if you start talk about a new Christendom, uh, it seems to me that all you're doing is talking about a reforming of, uh, of, uh, of Christianity along a different line than it might have uh, done before. Uh, from the very beginning, after the death of the apostles, there were various lines of, of Christendom developing, and some flourished and some didn't. And uh, even the ones that flourished eventually changed from what they originally were. So to say this is a new Christendom, I think, is, is really only to say that uh, um, history is repeating itself. Christianity is morphing a little bit. Uh, what we would call uh, apostate Christianity is changing. It constantly changes. And in the end, as uh, uh, like he says in the book, um, there's still a vitality to this uh, apostate Christianity that's going to carry it on well beyond the years that he's talking about. And the question is, what's it going to look like? Well, I, 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 you know, Paul, I agree with you to some extent. But really, the ultimately, when you get done with this book and put it on the table after you finish reading it, he's not really talking about a new Christendom. 
He's really talking about going back to first century Christendom. In other words, the Bible lives because these people confront poverty and displacement just as some, you know, William, Wayne Meeks and others have demonstrated how Christianity created a new community. And also the fact that for, for somebody living in Sweden or, or, or in New York City, they don't understand the power of exorcisms and healings. And so the Bible lives for these people. So it's actually maybe not a new Christendom, but going back to a first century Christendom. Yeah, uh, that, that's true. But the, the, the problem is with, with that, his ideas, and I think he's caught up in his own problem, that is, he's approaching it from an academic point of view and, and doesn't realize the vitality of Christianity from a personal nature. Um, there's always been that healing, that mysticism element of Christianity through all of the ages. You don't have to go back to the first centuries to see that. Um, and, and what we see, what he's describing in the Southern Hemisphere today is nothing more than what's always been going on in Christianity. Maybe not mainstream Christianity, but it's always been there. I think Paul uh, has a good point. Actually, I came at this book having just finished um, this one, The Churching of America from uh, 1776 to 2005, Winners and Losers in Our Religious Economy by uh, Roger Finke and Rodney Stark. Um, this is now the second edition. And it was interesting to see how people counted Christians and who counted as Christians. Uh, this one is bemoaning how the church was underrepresented and so on at the time of the revolution. But it was the problem was that the people who were doing the counting were Congregationalists, Episcopalians, and Presbyterians, and they were ignoring this, the rising sort of upstart sects called Methodists and Baptists, who, and the Methodists by 1850, were the largest denomination in the United States, and these others that had been doing the counting earlier on were, for all intents and purposes, marginalized. And what I see in this book is simply what. Stark and Finke are doing for the United States, now sliding south. And um, while the mainline denominations like the Church of England and so on certainly have planted strong communities and so on, they are not the communities that are offering a challenge in terms of lifestyle, nor are they the communities that are offering something back in terms of reward that is concrete and makes sense in terms of future life and so on. And so the upstart sects now are these, what we would see as non-mainline, maybe more marginal traditions that are taking very seriously not only their cultural um, elements that include miracles and healings and visions and dreams and all those sorts of things that uh, are very much a part of, say, Pentecostal Christianity. I remember meeting Dean Jackson the first time, who is the uh, Assemblies of God minister here in Provo, and said, hey, Dean, I just want you to know I'm a Pentecostal. I believe in all the restoration of the gifts. And any Mormon who thinks they're not a Pentecostal better go back and read their literature. Um, it's in that environment where they are looking for for the things that both fit cultural modes as well as Christian modes that we have been able to have success and I think will continue to have success. I, I wrote LDS along the margin as I was reading this book because, not because he mentioned them, but because it seemed to me that the Latter-day Saints offered many of the things that these traditions, particularly in Africa, were looking for and our competition in South America is not probably going to be the Catholics, but rather the Pentecostal groups right. that um, offer much the same thing. They're trying to restore New Testament Christianity. That's what we claim to be. And it's no wonder that there's an automatic flashpoint between Latter-day Saints and uh, evangelical or Pentecostal Christians, because we tr are essentially claiming to occupy the same territory and if my physics is right, two bodies cannot occupy the same space at the same time. And so there will automatically be 
conflict between us and others, but I think as, as we see the diminishing of the mainline denominations, um, particularly in that southern Asian, South American world, um, the very thing that Stark and Finke note as happening in this country is happening on a worldwide scale. Thank you, Roger. Uh, just to continue on and perhaps shift this a little bit, um, the, the argument here is the, that the author Jenkins keeps saying, I'm not a prophet, but uh, he, two or three times he denies himself, I can't be sure that this will take place. But he does say that by the year 2050, uh, the years in 2050, uh, as much as two billion and perhaps two and a half or three billion people may be uh, Christians at that point. He faces the idea that the Christianity will certainly change, change, change the picture of it. But I'm, I want to ask the panel, is there any other scenario? Could it be different? Is he wrong? As I said, he keeps saying he's not a, a prophet, but then he does prophesy quite closely. Uh, Anyone want to talk to that thing? Is there is there another are there other scenarios? That well, aren't well you know, secular prophets use statistics, and and, that, and this study is rooted in statistics. And you know, I think that f extrapolating from what he's he's watched happen, I think is probably logical conclusions. But he keeps that caveat. You know, I don't know what's going to happen. I think you know, if you read books like. Uh, the Episcopal Bishop of Newark's book, uh, Why Christianity Must Change or Die. I mean, now it's almost laughable. He really missed the point. And certainly, um, you know, secularists have said that, you know, Christianity must, be, must change in order to survive. It must be less literalist. Uh, it must be, you know, um, less, you know, more tolerant, etc. And it seems like certainly as we begin this new century that that is, has not been the case, that things are going along as he might predict. Uh, Islam was seemed to gonna eclipse Christianity. I think we've been all surprised in the last 10 years. It didn't. And even though it's growing quickly and fast, Christianity is, is keeping pace. You know, that was, that was one thing that surprised me to a degree. Uh, I was surprised at how rapidly Christianity was growing by his statistics because uh, I'd always assumed that Islam was the fastest growing religion, but so on the one hand, that gives me a good deal of hope because I think Christianity prepares better for the fullness of Christianity that we offer than does any other tradition. Um, so I, I, what I guess I see is a center of gravity moving south. I think he's right on that. Um, I don't know that there's systematic change. Somebody used that word a minute ago, and I think the change is not systematic. I think it's almost charismatic and in the sense that the spirit is moving. And for those of you who don't know, I have not always been a Latter-day Saint. And Christianity for me is a very viable God-driven force in this world that the Lord, I think, is using to prepare the way in the long run for the restoration of the gospel. And so I can see God's hand in this uh, progression. It will be a different Christianity than that kind of thing from the Bishop of Newark because it's interesting as the, Catholic, as the Episcopal Church ordained uh, a gay bishop, many of the some of the Episcopal churches in this country are placing themselves under African Anglican bishops because of the conservatism of the orthodoxy and so on that resides there. And so we're seeing the giving away of, of Christian values and standards and so on and those still being maintained and held in the southern realm. My re initial reaction uh, to your question, Ted, is along the lines of what Roger was saying. Um, uh, and, and Richard pointed out that uh, the author here is using statistics to make his point, and I think uh, th that's a valid way of approaching it, but it's an academic point of view. Uh, one of the things that I think he fails to point out in the book is that the kind of Christianity that he sees um, uh, becoming triumphant in the Southern Hemisphere are exactly the same kinds of Christianities that are 
growing in the northern hemisphere. Uh, in the United States, it's those evangelical groups that are growing, and the mainline Protestant groups that are kind of moribund are not growing that much. Um, and in that respect, I wanted to quote one little thing from his book because it really sparked, touched me in, in one point. This is on page 135. A religious believer might accept that God really is inaugurating a new era of signs and wonders to give Christianity a kind of rebirth. Such a revival would be all the more miraculous because it so directly contradicts every secular assumption and undermines the values of the world's dominant social order. Well, this, this is precisely, I think, what is happening in the world right now, not just in the Southern Hemisphere, in the Northern Hemisphere also. Uh, whenever the Lord has wanted to accomplish his purposes, he's stirred up the pot, turned up the heat, got it boiling, stirred it up, um, threw in some new ingredients, uh, made the smell go out throughout the room so everybody got a little bit hungry. This is what happened in Galilee when Christ was born. Uh, according to Josephus, there were 60 different Jewish sects, most of them resident in Galilee in his day. Uh, and people were talking about religion. People were, uh, were discussing religion back in those days. And Christ comes in that moment and offers the true religion. The same thing has happened uh, in several ages of the world. The last time it happened on a major scale that affects us, of course, was the um, the Second Great Awakening, which led to Joseph Smith to go into the grove. Uh, people were interested in religion, and they were interested in, in fundamental religion. And that's what's happening again in the world today. And I can't help but think that um, uh, the Lord's hand is in, in this, stirring up the pot, preparing the world for uh, the next stage in, in the spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It really, uh, really interesting. One of the things in the book that you get the con that you kind of conclude with is the fact that these people from Africa and from uh, Asia and from South America are basically they've come to the United States. They're not happy with the Christianity they're hearing in the mainline seminaries, and so they're going back and creating this the development. But he also predicts, if you want to use the word, that maybe in the future Europe and North America will have brown missionaries teaching their Christianity back in the north and there might be this might be a fertile mission field I mean quite honestly I'm kind of pessimistic about Europe he says it might be a great mission field in the future and it's kind of an interesting twist on it, for the Africans to come to Europe. yes for the Africans to come to Europe Actually, I'd like to suggest that's already happened the the Universal Church in Brazil has a lot of missionaries here in the United States Brazilian missionaries so. One of the things that I just like to, uh, would like to point out, and that is the the way the structure of evangelical Protestantism coming from the bottom and having no uh, no uh, overriding structure structure means that all of these religions are different depending upon where they are culturally. I mean, if you if you go to an evangelical meeting in Mozambique, where I've been, and go to the same church in in uh, in Brazil, it is a very very different church. In Mozambique, it is very African. African um, um, stories, African ideas are, are, are permeating that. And so I, I mean, I'm not even sure what the definition really is of Christianity anymore as I see all of these huge differences. And I, I, think, I think in many ways it is, it's, they're very, you know, Christianity is, is changing because of that lack of a formal structure over, over these religious groups. I think that's an important change that's occurring. You know, when you pointed something that concerned me and yet I'm, excited to see some of that lack of structure because I think it lets the spirit move in a uh, in a freer way than a heavy overlay and yet it also creates the danger of too much culture creeping, in, uh, creeping into the uh, Christian message and um, we struggle with that as Latter-day Saints you know what is the gospel that has to be exported and how much is culture, how much is gospel? What is the core, you're saying? Yeah, what's the core? And uh, I know that uh, at the general authority level, that issue has been wrestled with. Um, I, I guess probably the most horrendous example of lack of sensitivity to that among Latter-day Saints that I know of was in India, where uh, a missionary couple got all the converts together and said, okay, now you guys are Latter-day Saints. It's time you learn to eat roast beef. And if you know anything about Indian culture, the cow is sacred. <laughs> um, and so can you be a good Latter-day Saint and be a vegetarian? I happen to think that maybe you will be in the millennium since no one will hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain and you might as well get used to it now. 
Um, but um, well, but those good Sunday dinners, you know. I know, I know. No more pot that, roast, that, darn. Pot roast every Sunday. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you know the the one thing that um, we bring that is not present in these in these traditions is the prophet who can speak to the world. And if I go to church in Bangalore, India, or if I go in London, or if I go in Salt Lake, I'm in the same church. And uh, I'm receiving the same lessons. I'm receiving the same doctrine. And um, most, of the, most of the time. Well, I could say that for my high priest quorum, too. Uh, <laughs> Walsburg. Uh, Your wife is here. I'll bet she gets a different lesson every Sunday in Relief Society than you get in high priest. You know, I'm sure of that. <laughs> um, but I do believe that a large piece of the restoration, well, the major piece of the restoration is this line of authority that gives order, unity, and total guidance. And uh, Davies at the, um, um, uh, not the Smithsonian, but the Library of Congress um, said, until we changed and let culture creep in and whatnot and got rid of this heavy overlay, we'd never be a worldwide church. And I challenged him on that and said, you're wrong. We're going to prove that you can be a worldwide church with leadership. Well, thank you. Now, one of you are going to have to write the book of Mormonism as the new Christendom. Uh, obviously, obviously, that was what we'd like, but the Book of Mormon tells us that we're never going to be huge, doesn't it? Don't I find that uh, once or twice mentioned in the Book of Mormon? Let me just mention a, a couple of things, and we want to get to you. As we look at, uh, at uh, the movement of Christianity toward the South, now, Latin America, from Mexico on, on down, is already Christian, right? But what we're looking at, is, as uh, Mark indicated, is quite a change. That is, that there's a change as the Catholic Church weakens or it moves into more charismatic uh, Catholicism and as Protestants and Evangelicals become much more stronger. In, in Africa, we're looking at a different situation where people have not been traditionally uh, Catholic or traditionally c Christian and are moving from animism to Christianity and certainly carrying some of that animism in, in, into the thing. A similar uh, situation in Southeast Asia. Simply haven't been Christian, but it is becoming Christianized. So it's not a single phenomenon. Are, are you with me on that? That there, there are different movements taking place. And uh, to me, it's not a, a unified Christendom. Quite to the contrary, it's a much more diverse Christendom that's taking place. Uh, I have five or eight more questions that I would have liked to ask, but, but there simply isn't time. I wanted to talk about the concept of birth rate and things that do take place. Uh, he talks about the urbanization, and we know when we get urbanization and prosperity, birth rate typically goes down. That would indicate fewer fewer uh, Christians from that, that thing. But he also talks about this, although he doesn't use the word as the third world church. He doesn't ever use that word, but that's almost what he's saying, that this is going to be a church of the poor. This is not going to be a church uh, of the well-to-do, of the elite, the North American uh, prosperous Christians, uh, again, according to what he, he said here. Uh, uh, Richard, you have one single comment, and then we want to let, give you yeah, some time you to know, ask questions. I, I, you know, the, the book has so many facets, but I, I think most interesting, and particularly those like Paul and Roger, who, who we've also lived in the Middle East, this issue about Islam and about okay, Jewish relations. Yeah. To me, this is the most, maybe the most insightful part of the book is his discussion of the potential conflict between Islam and this new Christianity, but also the point of the disintegration of Jewish-Christian relations. The Northern Europe, Europe and the United States, because we live in the post-Holocaust world, are sensitive to this Jewish-Christian dialogue. But in Africa and in Asia and in South America, he claims they have no connection, so they are not going to be as sympathetic to Jewish causes. And in most churches, he says, support the Palestinian movement and don't simply have a context. So he said there's going to be a change in Jewish-Christian relations as a result of this, but also Central Africa is the place where Islam and Christianity are going to collide. Right. And it's scary if, and if and his are predictions are true. already colliding, aren't yeah. they, in, in Sudan and uh, Sudan? Sure. Uh, what he, he also mentions in here that you don't realize when you see all these people starving to death in Africa that most of them are already Christians. Th these aren't, quote, pagans. These are, are already Christians who, who uh, we ought to have a little more compassion for. Yeah, I think along with that, too, I mean, this is the part that's scary. This is the, s this is the scenario that's scary. And he does scary. deal with this in the book. But 
not only the Christian Islamic tensions that exist within national boundaries and so on, but even the Christian Christian tensions that exist and have led to some of the worst um, genocides that we've seen in Africa. Those were not Muslim Christian, they were Christian against Christian. And so, um, unfortunately, human beings seem to be sinners, no matter what part of the world they live in. Thank you very much. We'll, we'll entertain questions uh, from you who are sitting there. Uh, go ahead. Observations, Mark, is that your area? I, I, the question was uh, the, uh, uh, what's happening in terms of the uh, ch religious change among the Hispanic community? Yeah. And what's the next about yeah. the You know, I, I haven't really studied that very much, but I, I do. Um, uh, um, I, I'm. Um, Initially, initially when Hispanics come up to the United States, they gain they they get closer to the to Catholicism, and I think that's the first thing. I'm not sure what happens after that, and and uh, and the movements. I, I I think a part of it uh, would have to do with the strong missionary movement that's occurring from that's actually coming up from Latin America and coming from these evangelical churches. But other than that, I'm not sure. Maybe. I understand that theory. The question is, I'm not sure how much of that really happens. My experience is that, is that b because they're up here in an alien society, that oftentimes they go to what they know, and that tends to be c Catholicism. And I'm not, I'm not really sure how, uh, how much of their, their movement is to Pentecost. I see relatively small in what I'm reading toward the Pentecostal. However, uh, it, well, we, as this book indicates, it doesn't. They don't know quite where to put us. Uh, they, they, he kind of lets us be Christians if we want to be. But uh, just recently, about a month and a half ago, a change was made at the uh, at church headquarters, and that is that every missionary called to Southern California, the various missions in Southern California, now has to learn Spanish. Every missionary. What does that tell you? Th that's where their success is. I serve as branch president at the MTC, and I've had branch. Pr I've had missionaries going to South Dakota, Spanish-speaking missionaries going to South Dakota, Anchorage, Alaska, a and so on. We know that th that's where the LDS Church is finding considerable success, and and that's what you say. I I've talked to some mission presidents who tell me that two uh, the missionaries who s or Spanish-speaking missionaries are baptizing two to three times as many as the English-speaking missionaries in their same uh, American geographical area. So that, that's true. Evangelical, I, I don't see that. Uh, I, I don't see too many of them going to the evangelical, uh, some more the Catholics. Other questions or comments? <coughs> yes, do you want to take a mic so you can be recorded for posterity? I was wondering about the, the first comments about why the fact that these things, uh, the rise of Pentecostal movements and evangelical was due to that scholars were kind of afraid of the the mystical aspects and the, the spirit and things like that. Is that still the case with, uh, with scholarship? And, uh, or is Jenkins one of the first ones to kind of bridge that gap? And wh what are, wh what's the literature like nowadays? Well, I don't know. My experience with uh, people in seminaries and so on, uh, there you can kind of bridge faith and scholarship. You get into graduate school, even at a, at a Duke, which had a where I was and had a, a good, um, solid foundation in terms of faith, there you begin to get the sense that you can't mix those two. And um, uh, so there's a, 
there's a sense that I can't mix the spirit with my academics. And actually, I gave the closing talk at the uh, Library of Congress thing that we had on Joseph Smith. And um, Davies heard me basically being too religious to be in an academic setting. He didn't understand what was going on. Well, I can't separate my scholarship from my religion, and I don't see the two as necessarily antithetical to one another, but I think a lot of the scholarly world does. I think, I think we also have to keep in mind some of the history of Christianity in Western Europe. Um, near the close of the Hundred Years' War uh, between the Protestants and the Catholics, there was uh, a lot of people who were disgusted with what religion was doing to Europe. One of them was a Jewish fellow named Spinoza who came up with the idea well, why don't we treat religion like any other secular topic? And that caught on, basically, in Western Europe. Let's treat religion like any other secular topic. Let's divorce it from this kind of fanaticism which has wrecked uh, havoc on Europe for 100 years. And basically, that's where Western Christi Northern uh, Hemisphere, Western Christianity is today. Let's divorce Christianity from this fanaticism. Let's get into reason. Let's get into logic. Let's talk about it on, on secular terms, religion. And that's basically the route that academics have gone, and they've stuck with that uh, pretty much. Um, and, and that has led to some interesting things in Western civilization also. I haven't read the Pope's latest talk uh, yet. I've heard second and third hand the one given in Germany that got him in so much trouble. Um, but I understand from second and third, third hand that he is talking about how religion must use reason and logic to avoid the kind of fanaticism that has happened in the past with religion. And that, of course, is a typical European stance and, and one which has, uh, for the most part, with exceptions like Northern Ireland, spared Europe a lot of religious uh, fanatical uh, despotism and, and uh, slaughter. Yeah, you know, the, one of the things that he points out is it's this independent nature of this, quote, new Christendom, like Islam, since it doesn't have a caliph in charge, that you have this increased uh, uh, opportunity of intolerance and persecution among the groups. And that's where he sees the conflict coming. I think, you know, my experience at UC Irvine, which was a Marxist school, I mean, you, you talked about Christianity only in the terms of liberation theology. That was the only respectable way to talk about religion. And, and there were, you know, of course, the hope was that it w we would have a secular, we'd have a benevolent secularism at, at best, but at worst, maybe, you know, liberation theology would fulfill its aims. I think it, because of that prejudice, they were unwilling to see what was going on or to believe that it would actually have a profound long-term effect. And I think they've all been surprised. Now, whether or not they will start to seriously reconsider this or, or not is still, you know, still up in the air, I think. But, but I'm sure you've gotten the message, you who asked the question, that, that uh, th this book says that that uh, rationalist uh, approach is not going to produce converts. It's not going to produce n uh, fervent Christians. To the contrary, it, it produced what, what Europe may be now. And that Christianity is moving south because it can find this fervor in feel and fervor in the strength of, of one's individual conviction. Mac? What he's, t what he's talking about is moving moving south, but within, um, you know, um, gross national product. In a sense that south in in poverty and in, in how much uh, a person is making and where his worries and where his passions are, and that would say to me that the, the urban centers in Latin America would be have to be called the part of the northern hemisphere in that sense. The religion is moving out of the urban centers into the third world country, which is uh, quite a bit, at least in Latin America, is, is kind of the, the, the situation now in, in, in some large urban centers. So is that what he's talking about, or is he talking about doesn't matter if they're rich and they're below the equator? Uh, I'm not sure I'm getting your point because what, it, what the book is saying obviously is, is that so the southern hemisphere has and will have a heck of a lot more large urban centers as well. That, that is, that's, that's urbanization is coming there. Look at Sao Paulo. Uh, so it, it's not necessarily going to be the church of the poor. No. 
Well, but but still, you can be pretty poor in an urban lo uh, urban center, uh, as, as Latin America and Africa is proving that that urbanization doesn't result in in in, in great the expected wealth. In fact, that's a large point. Yeah. That it is that urbanization where the poor are coming in and live uh, disconnected uh, with the community. They've disconnected with their previous community and now find in the religious community that that unity that uh, that sense of community that was lost in moving in becoming urbanized uh, so uh, in the northern hemisphere or the where the christian dumb is leaving does that mean that it is leaving from the poor class in the northern uh, areas as well uh, i'm not sure that there, there's that that's dealt good question we'll have to leave it i think in in line with your question on uh, page 93 there's a very interesting uh, table the 10 largest cities in the year 2015 will be in this order. Tokyo, Bombay or Mumbai, Lagos, Shanghai, Jakarta, Sao Paulo, Karachi, Beijing, Dhaka, Mexico City. Not one of them in Europe or the United States. And of course that's this point by, you know, as we look at this chart from uh, 2025 to 2050, basically where Christianity was, you know, in Europe, will be third place, and by 250, it will not even be in the top four. In other words, it is these large areas that are growing by birth rate, and also these large urban areas that become the dominant centers of Christianity, and it's among the poor. And so the question is, you know, can, in fact, uh, Christianity survive? Will it be a religion of poverty and persecution? Or will it be a peaceful, prosperous Christianity? And he's predicting that it will end up being, a, you know, poverty and persecution. The United States on that list was still the largest Christian community in the world. And, and this is one of the, the realities that the United States just seems to be a darn exception. He uses the word anomaly. Yeah, anomaly to, to, to this thing because religion is still alive and growing rapidly. Let's... Uh, just want to make a point. One, uh, one a recent study on uh, on development of, uh, of of these movements in Latin America uh, basically stated that there are three elements that are important in the change of religion or, if, or in a religion growing that that it be female, poor, and that there be some sort of a healing experience. And that was the three elements, the three uh, uh, variables that he felt were important in growth of religious groups. And certainly, you know, Christianity will continue to grow, and there will always be evangelical missionary efforts in the United States and Canada. But he does say, it, to say white Christian will be an oxymoron, like saying Swedish Buddhist. Very good. One more question, Lee. Will. That was one of the things that struck me about the book. He talks about all these trends that are happening in, in the next Christendom, uh, even down to some of the details, uh, struck me as paralleling what I thought was a Latter-day Saint phenomenon, um, uh, including the whole thing about social mobility. You join the church and, and you, you raise yourself up. Uh, that's part of the appeal of Protestantism in Latin America, apparently. So, uh, again, this is part of, 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 of a whole movement, I think, in the world that, that um, is fostering the kind of environment that we as a church would like to see happen. And I, uh, this is kind of piggybacking on something Ted said. Um, of, I, I do think that um, we're seeing this growth, Christian growth, but we'll never be more than a fragment of that. Okay. Um, they, uh, Christianity, as it grows, prepares the way wherever it is for us. And I think Dale LeBaron's little book on All Are Alike Unto Christ, of those 400 persons he interviewed, 398 of them were Christians before they became Latter-day Saint Christians. Two of them were Muslim. Now, thank God for the Catholic and Protestant missionaries that were in black Africa preparing the way for the church, and I think that's going to still happen, but it's always going to be a fragment of that group. Thank you. Uh, 
uh, our last assignment in Chile was, was corresponded at the same time Elder Holland was there, and he, he on one occasion simply said, we could baptize entire villages in, in, in Africa. He said it would be so easy to, to baptize on a big, big scale, but we have to go slow. We have to wait till we develop priesthood and ha have the leadership uh, for that, that period. But I, but I do think there's a difference, though. You know, Even though, as you read this book, you, it seems so many parallels, like Paul said he discovered that, there is a difference. It seems to me that he is predicting, and I, and I think that, that contemporary uh, news would, would – say this is true, is that this independent Christianity that is, that is recruiting from poverty is also a Christianity that in many cases is becoming intolerant and can persecute just as much. Mm -hmm. Where Mormonism, I think at least the current leadership of the church has been very careful as we send goods to uh, places where there are Muslims, we don't put church literature in it. We've, we've been very careful not to confront Islam. And what he says here is that the elements, uh, fundamental elements of Islam and Christianity are going to you know, are going to collide. And I think that's where maybe the difference between us and these other Protestants are in South America. We do not anticipate, and we will not become a radical movement that will I increase persecution right. and we'll intolerance. We'll try to avoid that. We've got to end. We thank you for your tolerance uh, of us. Whatever. Up here we can fight. We really haven't been as combative as, as we might have been. Uh, I'm sorry to say but that would have been more exciting had we had we fought with each other. But uh, Mormons seem to get along fairly well, uh, fortunately. Uh, thank you very much for coming. I notice there are some goodies back on the table. Uh, take advantage. Thank you very much.